Well, good morning and welcome. This is the day the Lord has made. We are clearly here rejoicing mm -hmm. and glad in it. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Well, Amen. it's been a wonderful morning already with Sunday school upstairs over in building two. Lots being taught about God's word the saints being sanctified and encouraged in the most holy faith. And now we come to our worship time. But before we start, let me remind you of those things going on this week. First and uh, quickest coming to us after worship today, we will break for 12 minutes. Um, and then we'll come back in for exactly our 12. quarterly family meeting where we'll go over a lot of things for 2021. So if you're able, please plan to stay. If you're going to stay, the Derringer family is going to back his truck up and put his tailgate down and provide a small snack for those of you who have blood sugar level uh, issues or uh, loud stomachs that grumble if you don't get lunch right away. Uh, so there will be, for those staying, a small snack right outside the door. I'll give you 12 minutes to partake in that and come back. Uh, if you're going home, I would ask that you leave those there for the, the rumbling stomachs who are staying. And then that brings us to Monday. There'll be people up here uh, packing, preparing um, for Tuesday ministry. Monday night, there'll be men's Bible study upstairs at 6.30. Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, community ministry here. Wednesday night, youth upstairs. Women upstairs, 6 o'clock for both of those. Thursday, living for Jesus. Friday, thankful it's Friday. Saturday, almost to Sunday. And then Sunday, we'll be here again. All right, that takes us through the week. I think I covered everything there. Um, enough silliness. Now to the seriousness of the Savior, uh, which is why we're here. And praise the Lord that he has brought you and I here to this place, mm -hmm. to the praise of his glorious grace. Because... Uh, we used to remember walk in the ways of the world and we used to wake up and we used to pursue things that don't last and we used to pursue things that disappoint but God has placed it in our hearts to be here together this morning to worship corporately him the God of all creation the one who knows us the one who has saved us the one who's preparing a place for us and so he has made us glad for what he has done in Christ uh, Matt, will you give us a call to worship, please? Yes, Pastor Brian, thank you so much. And uh, actually, that last, the last few statements lead us right into our call to worship uh, from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. It says, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. So as we prepare to, to worship God this morning through singing and through the hearing of the word, I just ask you, are you walking in the darkness or are you washed in the blood of Jesus Christ? Please stand, and we're going to begin our worship singing, uh, Are You Washed in the Blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? Spotless are they white as snow. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In the bridegroom coming through your robes be white. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansions bright? And be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? 
are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean, oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Man, praise the Lord. And if we are washed in the blood of the Lamb, it is only because of the mercy that God has shown us. Mm -hmm. All-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger. So tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord praise the lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many darkness new every war our sins they are many his mercy is more amen amen, amen. <clears throat> praise the lord indeed well good morning it's now time to worship through our giving let's go to the lord in prayer father we just uh, come before you today and just so appreciative, Lord, of all the things that you do for us every day, mm -hmm. uh, waking us up this morning, putting air in our lungs, uh, giving us our health, 
and all the provisions that you make for us throughout the day. May we be truly grateful, Father, for those gifts. Mm. And Father, now it's time that we bring back uh, to you an offering. Um, we just, uh, in a small part, want to show our gratitude in worshiping you through our giving. Help us to do that with the right mindset, the right mm -hmm. heart today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You Amen. can bring your offering up here to the plates here, and there's also one in the back. Join as we continue worshiping God, singing holy, holy, holy.
praise the Lord. You may be seated. Well, as you're being seated, I'll invite the children, six and under, to go out, if you so desire, with Miss Heather. Uh, she'll be taking them across the parking lot to Building 2 uh, during the time as Pastor Craig prepares to preach the word. Those six and under interested in going with Miss Heather, you are dismissed at this time. As you know, we it is our practice to pray prior to one of the elders preaching. And when we pray, we are purposefully conveying a message to God. Purposefully conveying a message to God. And I want to encourage you to be active in the corporate prayers. Corporate meaning we are all together. We're not at home praying in our prayer closets by ourselves, but rather we are together this morning in worship corporately. And so we are praying corporately. And you often hear the amen. What does that word mean? It is an adverb that means truly. In the verb form, it means to confirm. And sometimes it is translated, may it be so. And so you as the congregation always feel free as you actively participate in our corporate prayer. You are engaged in your heart and mind. And as truth is purposefully conveyed to God, we together we find ourselves united in these requests before God, then it is a natural response to say amen to something that you hear that is true, you recognize as true from the scriptures, something that is on your heart as well as a request to God. Yes, may it be so. The psalmist in 106 verse 48 says, Blessed be the Lord the God of Israel from everlasting even to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. And then in the New Testament, as Paul, in the context of the church, and specifically referencing spiritual gifts, which God gives for the common good, he says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, but in chapter 14, he's explaining how if God has given you the spiritual gift to be able to pray in another language, then it is hard for others who don't understand the language. And so he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 16, that we should pray with our mind also in the context of the church. Otherwise... If you bless in the Spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen, in quotes? And so, common practice, Old Testament, New Testament, for corporate worship, people involved in prayer together to render the amen. Um, if you feel so led, you're always welcome to say the amen. And then on our hearts and minds, I think specifically again this week is our nation. And the, the prayer for the peaceful transition of power to occur this week in the presidency. And I'm reminded of the scriptures that inform us and as a consequence encourage us. For example, in the book of Daniel chapter 4 verse 17 we read, In order that the living may know, that's all of us, that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. Make no mistake, there's only one God. We are not Him. And God bestows on it, what is that? The realm of mankind. He bestows on it whom He wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. God sets over the kingdom of men, ultimately whomever He chooses for the purpose to bring Him glory. We see time after time in the Old Testament, sometimes that's a righteous person, sometimes it's an unrighteous person. We, of course, live by biblical principles and cast our vote, but ultimately the scriptures teach us that God puts people in charge over the realms and the kingdoms of men. And then finally, Paul urges Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2 regarding prayer. 
First of all, then, I urge you that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Does that sound something uh, familiar on your heart and mine this morning and on the heart and mind of our nation this week? And so we find in the Word of God instruction. And so that is my focus this morning during this pastoral prayer before Pastor Craig comes forward. So engage your heart and mind with me during this time. Make your own petitions and requests to the Lord um, as, as you pray silently, as, as I pray up here together. Let's join our hearts and minds together even now. Pray with me. Father God, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is your world, and history unfolds as your story, and we understand that it is all for your glory. It is both our responsibility and our privilege to participate with you in the coming of your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven and so as the local church this morning we knit our hearts together first and foremost to acknowledge that you are God and that you are sovereign over us and so what that means is we we stand in in confidence and in faith that all is well because you are on your throne So regardless if there is peace in the streets on earth or there is unruly mobs rioting, that does not change the fact that you are sovereign over us and you are orchestrating all things for your glory and our good. So may our hearts be strengthened this morning as we come together to acknowledge you as the Lord of all and to praise you as such and to order our lives in light of these truths. We want to thank you for giving the kingdom of men to whomever you choose because we know you are perfect in your execution of the office of God Almighty. You are doing things perfectly and in perfect timing. And so you have ordained for us to be in the week of January 20th, 2021, in the United States of America. And so here we are by your divine decree, and we, in humility, submit to you. And we accept as reality the events before us. Now, in that light, we also are encouraged by you to pray for these rulers and leaders that you have set up. And it is our desire that they, first and foremost, honor you, follow you, and please you that they rule and reign in righteousness. It is our desire that they would follow biblical principles, that we would be under the blessing of biblical leadership. And so, God, for those in office serving as our governmental and political leaders and servants, we pray first and foremost for their salvation, that you would be gracious to them, opening their eyes to see and their ears to hear. Remind us to be faithful to pray for their salvation. Remind us that that no one we listen to on the radio or the TV is beyond your saving grace. The Apostle Paul was so kicking against the goads, fighting against you, killing Christians, yet you miraculously, in a moment, saved him and rescued him and dramatically changed him to be perhaps the greatest of all apostles. And so we pray that for our leaders even now. God, we desire to live a quiet and tranquil life. We pray that you would bless us with that. If you see fit, to cause us to live in a time of trial and tribulation, then we pray that you would bolster our faith, that you would strengthen us to stand firm, to resist the devil, and to love always our neighbor, even as ourself. And remind us that in loving them, first and foremost, we have the gift, this precious treasure in jars of clay about the truth of the gospel. May it go forth from our church here corporately. May it go forth from each family represented. And then each individual, as you have them over even the days of this week, influencing people in school, at work, in recreation, 
in all manners of our social interactions and life. God, please be glorified through us. Give us the strength and the sanctification that we might be an example, a light, that they may see our good deeds and glorify you who are in heaven. God, as Pastor Craig comes to preach from Genesis chapter 6 this morning, we are reminded of the wickedness that filled the earth in that day. And so as we look in relative terms, that day was so much more worse than this day. So we know that you have called our brothers and sisters who have gone before us to endure much greater trial and tribulation than we are going through. After all, this morning there are more people gathered in faith in Christ Jesus in this small church on this small island that were saved during the whole time of Noah, only eight. Yet you have gathered this morning many more than that who call upon the name of the Lord. So our time is not like that time at all. Our time is much more free and much more accepting of the truth of your word. So we give thanks for the blessings that we enjoy day in and day out. And we pray for more. We pray that your kingdom would come. We pray that you would be honored and glorified. We pray that you would start with us. We pray that you would do it even more so now as Pastor Craig comes to preach and proclaim from Genesis chapter 6 your word and your truth. We pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, that you would inspire us to live for Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Good job and amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Please go ahead and open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, if you haven't beaten me to that already. Uh, corruption comes to mind. Corruption is a little bit about what we're going to talk about today, and I think we see corruption uh, in the world all around us, right? Um, all you have to do today to see corruption is to turn on your TV or turn on the radio. And even as I say that, um, you know, a lot of things that Pastor Brian was just talking about before a time of prayer so relevant, right, politics right now and all the things that are happening. And even as I say, listen, the radio, does anyone even get their news from the radio anymore? It's probably more appropriate to say uh, your favorite social media outlet or platform, um, and that is if you're not one of the many millions who have left the social media platforms of Facebook and Twitter and, and all the things that we see going on there because of corruption, in fact, there, right? So that's the odd thing is that uh, those who are reporting on, whether it's the TV or the radio or the uh, social media or whatever it looks like, those who are reporting on the corruption are in fact corrupt themselves. Uh, and so we have corruption reporting on corruption, and it's just running rampant everywhere. And I see a lot of nods and a lot of big eyes because we understand that this is the world w that we live in. And to, to Pastor Brian's point, uh, it's always been this way. And, and we may think, oh, it's the worst now it's ever been. You know, I think we look at the day of Noah and say, I don't know that it is worse than it's ever been. Uh, but it's always been there, and it's always been bad, right, with corruption and all the things that we have. And we know the reason for that is what? Sin. That's right. Uh, the reason for our corruption, for the wickedness and the evil in the world is all because of sin. Uh, I think of the, uh, you know, I think of the uh, rapper. He's a hip-hop rapper, uh, Shy Len. Some of you young people know who I'm talking about. He has a song in which he says, it's because all sin has I in the middle of it, okay? It's I, it's you, it's me. We're the problem, right? We, our sinful nature and our wickedness and our evil hearts, and so we should expect to see a world of darkness all around us that we do see. But isn't it refreshing when in the middle of the darkness and the chaos and, uh, and the corruption and everything you see, you see someone who stands out because of their integrity, someone who stands up for the truth, and it's like light in the darkness, right? It really is light in the darkness. And so it is a great thing when we see that. And so we could go on and on and on this morning to, to paint this picture of our world today. And I think what we're talking about here certainly does capture and is a good depiction of our world today. Uh, but I know that certainly it is a good description or depiction of the world in the time of Noah. And so as we get into our text this morning, we're going to see that uh, a little bit more. We're going to pack it as we move forward. <clears throat> so let's remember where we've been. Since chapter 3, we have seen the fall of mankind. We have seen this corruption. We have seen the sinfulness and the effect of sin on man. We also see uh, the effect that, that that has with God because in sin, uh, all that we see happening is God's wrath being built up, God's judgment being built up. We talked about this a lot last hour in Sunday school. 
that there's these threads going through the Bible, these themes through the Bible. And one we always talk about is certainly the scarlet thread, right, of Christ and salvation and God's grace. But the first one we see going through there is man's corruption and man's sinfulness, which leads to God's wrath and God's judgment. And therefore, these two go hand in hand, right? Because God's judgment is wrath is coming, but also with that, he is gracious and good and he is kind, right? So these two things go together and they are all throughout the scripture as we see it. Because God is righteous, he is just, and he must deal with sin. He must judge sin. And again, we see his graciousness, we see his goodness. And he promised that, remember in Genesis 3.15, the promise of the one who would come to crush the head of the serpent, the, the one who would come through the seed of the woman. And since that time, we have been tracing, if you will, those two seeds. We've been going through genealogies. We've been tracing these lines, these, uh, this righteous line and this wicked, wicked line, if you will, this line of Cain and this line of Seth and the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the woman. And so we continue to track that, and we continue to see it. And remember a couple of weeks ago, in fact, I took you all the way to New Testament, and over a span of some 4,000 years later, when Christ enters that line, and the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus comes, the promised one of Genesis 3.15, comes to reconcile man, to redeem man, and to right the wrongs that man has done. Last week, recall that Pastor Brian talked about one who is in this righteous line, whose name is Noah. And we started to get into Noah's time a little bit more. And we saw how the, the, the wickedness and the evilness in Noah's day was at an all-time high. In fact, it says that every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. That sums it up pretty good. Okay, uh, it doesn't get worse than that. And how God was sorry. Remember it says that God repented, that God was sorry that he made man. And that he said, I am going to blot man off the face of the earth. And so he is going to wipe out man, Adam, human beings, from the face of the planet that he created. But also in this, again, we see righteousness, holiness, justice of God, right? And graciousness, mercy, compassion, long-suffering. Think about the long-suffering. He said, I will give man 120 years to repent and turn of their ways. You have 120 years until the judgment and the wrath comes. So even being more patient again in that. We see that he is gracious to Noah as we left off last week. Uh, it was verse 8 that says, but Noah, and there's that conjunction again, but, right? And, and my favorite, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who said, um, praise God or thank God for the buts in the Bible. And here we have a big one. But Noah found favor, or I believe the King James says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So he chose to be gracious to Noah. So this morning, follow along with me, please. We will pick up the text in verse 9. Of chapter 6. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms, and you shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you should make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top. And set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Verse 17. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, and which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. 
and every living thing of all flesh. You shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind, after every creepy thing of the ground after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this text. Thank you for these themes, for these threads, for these truths, these principles that we see throughout your scriptures. We thank you first and foremost for your grace and for your mercy and for the promise of all those who believe in you shall be saved, and how blessed is the one whose sin is not imputed to him. And so we are so grateful and thankful for you calling us to this ministry of reconciliation, by which we are called to be ambassadors for Christ, as though we, that you through us, are pleading and begging sinners to come to be reconciled to God. And that is certainly what I am here to do this morning. And also that the, the saints would be encouraged, that the saints would be edified, that you would sanctify us in the truth of your word. So we ask for understanding. We ask for you to illumine our minds to the things that you have for us today, that you would allow us to set us aside all distractions, starting with me, God. I pray that I would be uh, an open vessel and a conduit for you and for the things that you have to speak uh, to us here this morning, God. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So the title of today's sermon is Character in the Midst of Corruption. And our focus, as I said, is going to now be shifting onto a specific family. We're going to shift into looking the next few chapters into Noah and his family. Because remember, this is really a big genealogical record. From chapter 5 to 11 is a genealogy, and then there's a couple pauses in between. So as we get to Noah in, in the line... We now stop, and Moses says, this is an important story or important historical account that you need to know and you need to understand, okay? So we're going to be focusing on that uh, for really for the next few chapters. Six, seven, and eight are really all about the flood. However, we understand in that, the focus isn't really on Noah, right? Because the focus in the scriptures is always on God, okay? It's always on God, and so we certainly want to make that clear. The first thing we see mentioned in the text this morning is about the character of Noah. If you look at verse 9, it tells us that Noah was a righteous man, he was a blameless man, and that he walked with God. Sounds pretty good. Like, man, I pray that people would describe me like that, right? And, And this phrase, haven't we seen this before, this walk with God? Didn't we hear that already before? Remember we talked about Enoch, and it says that he walked with God. Uh, And we certainly see, and that was back in chapter 5, verse 22. We see certainly the principle laid down as well by Paul in Galatians 5, where he tells us to walk by the Spirit. So we see this principle of believers who are filled with the Spirit of God are to be walking by the Spirit. We are to be walking with God. Okay, So all of us are to be doing that in our walking with God. It also says that Noah was righteous and blameless. Now we know that no one is, no one, not Noah, no one is purely blameless. No one is totally righteous, right? We understand that because of the principles of the scriptures. So we know in that, that you're only made righteous through Christ Jesus, right? So this points to us to understand that Noah is in fact in Christ Jesus. Now I understand you will say, well, Noah doesn't even know who Jesus is, And that is true. Noah and all those Old Testament uh, saints and all who died before Christ came, they don't know him as Jesus and the one who is the Son of God who is coming. But what did they know? They knew God's promise to send this Messiah, to send this anointed one, to redeem them. Okay, And so they, the same as us, believe the same promise and believe still by faith the same way we do. They're looking forward to the cross, if you will, right? In the hope of this promise that is coming, we look backward in the hope of the promise that came through Jesus Christ, okay? So we know that Noah was in Christ because verse 8 tells us that he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And we know that no one finds favor in the eyes of the Lord unless God grants them grace and favor. So not that he did anything to deserve or or merit or earn this favor, 
Rather, it was given to him by God. In fact, let's flip over to the New Testament. Go over to Hebrews chapter 11. And we have made our way there a couple times in this study of Genesis so far. Uh, We've looked at there for Abel. We looked there for Enoch. And now this morning, let's go and see Noah's name listed in this, this chapter that is maybe known as the Hall of Faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. It says, By faith Noah, being warned by God about things yet not seen, and reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Did you catch all that is in that verse? We could preach the whole time just on that verse, right? I know many of you could preach the whole time just on that verse. Look at how rich that is. By faith, Noah obeyed God, right? Just as I think forward, we will see that Abraham also walked with God. Abraham also, by faith, followed God. God said, hey, leave your town and just go, and I'll tell you later what you're going to do. And he left and he went, okay, by faith. And it says, because Noah was an heir of righteousness. So what does that tell us? That he's in the righteous line, right? He is of Christ, believing God about the things not yet seen. That's interesting. What is that speaking of? Speaking of the rain, speaking of the water, speaking of the flood that was about to come. Remember, we're at about 1,500 years or so is where we are now from the time of creation. Okay, the flood is going to happen in about another 100 years or so. Remember, God gave them 120 years. So we're right around 1,500, 1,550 years, somewhere in that time frame. And so there hasn't been rain up until this point. There's this myths we hear about in the creation account that watered the ground and the earth and did all these things. There's, there's water in different places, but there, there has been no rain. Uh, Pastor Brian even brought up this thought, uh, I think Nancy and I have maybe discussed this before, this thought of uh, how the, there was this big wall of water around the entire planet of earth that would have stopped all these UV rays, and perhaps that's part of the plan and part of the thing that God created to make man live a long time with no UV exposure, and there's just so many things to it, but they weren't aware of, of this, and that made it even uh, more strange to, to the world to hear that God was going to bring destruction, because remember, Noah, it says, was also a preacher of righteousness, preaching the coming wrath and destruction of God to all the people out there to say to repent, from your wicked ways, and to believe God is bringing this destruction upon us. No takers, though, except for his own family. So by faith, Noah believed and obeyed God. So this character of Noah, this righteousness that he has, this faith that the scriptures tell us that he has, or had and has, was given to him by God, right? It was imputed to him by God just as is imputed to all those who are called to believe in him. Uh, As Pastor Brian said in his prayer, to all those who call upon the name of the Lord. Those who call upon the name of the Lord are only those who have been called by the Lord, right? So it has been given to him just as it is to us. Verse 10 reminds us here that we are in the middle of a genealogy, as it tells us again of Noah's three sons. Ham, and Japheth. Now, we saw them listed before in our genealogy, correct? We saw it in the end of verse 5, that Noah was 500 years old when he became the father of these three sons. And this is where that genealogy of Adam, or this genealogy of Seth, pauses again to tell us of this flood account that happens in the days of Noah. Now, I don't want you to be confused about this timeline. I did want to uh, just kind of unpack this a little bit. As Pastor Brian and I talked about it, I believe, last week, um, just in our own private conversations. It does say in there that 120 years was given by God to the time of the flood, correct? But it specifically says in chapter 5 that Noah was 500 years old when he had his boys. Then in chapter 6, it says God gives 120 years. Then we will see when the flood comes, Noah is 600 years old. So it says Noah has his sons at 500, and the flood comes at 600. How long is that? 
Easy math, 100 years, right? So how do you get 120 years? So I would just say to you, this is a typical fashion of writing and a style of writing that we see uh, in the scriptures, and we certainly see just in Moses, in, in his own account here in this same book, that he is going forward with the story, and then he's going back, and he backtracks, and to give you a little more information. And that's why we come to Ham, Ham Shem, and Japheth again here. We already saw this, actually, in the creation account, how in chapter 1, we saw all the way through the sixth day and resting on the seventh day. Remember that? Then what's chapter 2 about? He backtracks and goes back to day 6 and says, before there was man on the planet, well, I thought he had already said that man was created. He's going back into the story to expound it a little bit more and give us some more details. We're going to see that again in chapter 10 and 11 with the Tower of Babel. We'll see the same exact thing repeating its, its, itself. So don't be uh, you know, concerned about that. There's certainly no contradictions in God's word. We know that it's inerrant, is an infallible, uh, uh, living, breathing entity. And so there are no mistakes there. Um, so I just wanted to, to go through that as I found that in my own studies again this week and to explain that a little bit. If you've got more questions about that, uh, you can certainly come and see me or, uh, or call me this week. So this is the timeline that we're talking about. And the next thing I want to I wanna see in the text that we see is the corruption now of the world. In verses 11 and 12, corruption of the world. We see the word corrupt three times. Okay, let's look at it. It says, now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. See the repetition again? See the theme here again? Okay, repetition, pointing out this corruption that was happening uh, and, and again, we already saw the depths of it as Pastor Brian took us through some of that. And, and back in chapter five, or excuse me, back in verse five, that every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. Look at verse 13. It tells us that the earth was filled with violence. It's full, right? It's corrupt. It's completely overrun. An interesting thing here is this Hebrew word here in verses 11 and 12 for corrupt is this word shahath. And it's interesting because it's also translated as destroy. Same word. And we see that word in verse 13. You see that? Destroy. And also in verse 17, destroy. Same word. Corruption and destruction. And so you see they go hand in hand. Okay? Corruption and destruction. So it means to destroy, to corrupt, to ruin. And essentially what we see here is that man in his wickedness, man in his sinfulness, in his corrupted state of mind, has ruined or destroyed the earth. And that in that, God is going to ruin or destroy mankind. And the earth along with it, yes? Because the earth certainly was destroyed. I believe it's Peter, it might, it perhaps is Paul. Paul's always a good guess, right, for the New Testament. So it perhaps is Paul. But one of the writers I'm recalling now says something to the fact that the old earth perished. He's talking about the pre-flood, okay, that antediluvian generation and in, in, uh, culture and civilization that we're talking about before the flood because the earth is totally different now, you guys. What we live on in this world that looks like today, totally different than what it looked like before the flood. The flood was a creation-changing event of chaos. Uh, chaos, obviously, under the order of a sovereign God, and, uh, and it changed the landscape of all things on this planet. Okay? The destruction of man is what is coming, which leads us to our next point here, and that is communication. We see here, between God and Noah, communication in verse 13. As God now communicates with his servant Noah, whom he chose to have favor on, what he is about to do to the earth and to mankind. And also what Noah is to do in preparation of that coming judgment. Now, we're going to talk more about this as we move forward into the flood account. But understand that the Bible indicates clearly to me that this flood was a worldwide deluge. This was a worldwide flood. Um, this was a catastrophic, as I said, creation-changing event. 
And I mention it because it jumps off the text here at me, right in our text. Just notice, even circle or underline or highlight if, if you do that in your Bible, how many times you see the words all or every or everything. Because that makes it pretty, pretty clear. We've already seen, look at verse 12, how it says, all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And how God told Noah in verse 13 that the end of all flesh has, be, has come before me. Verse 17 says, I am bringing a flood to destroy all flesh and that everything on the earth shall perish. Do you see it? All, every, everything. This isn't a picture that some would say of, uh, of a valley there that's in the Mesopotamian Valley in that area, in that region where it's kind of like a bowl and that God perhaps just flooded out this area to, to destroy all those who were wicked in this one area, and that was the part of the earth that was affected in this? <laughs> My simple question then would be, then why didn't God just tell Noah to move, <laughs> right? Why didn't he just have to say, pick up like he did to Abraham and move him? He didn't have to say, build this ark that needs to be able to be floating, okay? Um, and so I say that in jest, but uh, there is a, a thought out there that it was just a local flood, and I would tell you that we believe and teach uh, that it was a worldwide flood, okay, that destroyed, as it says, all things, all flesh, and every living thing on the planet, Now, in this, we also see a pattern developing, and we've seen that all through this, right? I've tried to point out patterns to us since chapter 1 and many patterns that we've seen. And we see this one throughout the scriptures, that man's sinfulness continues to multiply and multiply and multiply. Sin, sin, sin. Wicked, wicked, wicked. Evilness increases. And I talked about a little bit this morning, that in that, God's wrath is building, and it's building, and it's building, and it's building. And the scriptures tell us that it gets to a certain point and to where the iniquity is full. We will look at that later with Abraham, in fact. That once God's, in, the iniquity of man has reached its fullness, God's judgment comes. We see it in the flood. We see it in Sodom and Gomorrah. We'll see it in the future day of the Lord. Um, that is the pattern that we see. And also in that pattern, we see that God is long-suffering and patient, as we already talked about, how he gives 120 years before he brings the destruction until the iniquity of man is full or complete. And think about this. Think about how long-suffering and patient God is, but think about how long-suffering and patient and gracious he's been to us. We're talking about 1,500... To the time of the flood, we're, we're rolling with the date that we perceive as 1656. Okay, so 1,656 years to the time of the flood. God was patient for 650 years, and then he wiped out all of mankind. We, to now, from the flood, have been about 4,500 years. Do you see the patience and long-suffering of God? And we also see in the scriptures what's going to happen one day. His patience and his long-suffering is going to stop because the iniquity of man will reach again its tipping point. And then the Lord's going to come and crack open the sky. And the day of the Lord will commence. And his judgment and his wrath on the wicked and on the planet again will be poured out. Same thing, same pattern that we continue to see. And so this is a great picture, right, for us to understand what the future looks like. God's word is what tells us what the future looks like, right? Not mediums and spiritists and palm readers and all that nonsense. God's word tells us, in fact, Jesus in all of his discourse tells us the future day of the Lord that we're looking forward to, he says it's going to happen just like the days of Noah. Okay, then, then we should know about the days of Noah, right? Wickedness, do we see wickedness in our day? Okay. Through it all, God also chooses to communicate with his people, right? He warns his people. He tells his people be looking for these signs, be watching for these things. Why did Jesus tell us, oh, that day of the Lord, when I come back, it's going to look like the days of Noah. It's going to look like the days of Lot. He tells us in the Olive Discourse what that looks like and why he says it, to reveal to us the things he wants us to know and the things he wants us to understand. So he communicates with his people to inform them, to protect them, to preserve them, right, and to save them. 
And that's clearly what we see in this example of Noah. Now, the next thing we see is how God gives certain instruction here to Noah. Verses 14 to 17, we see this. And in fact, in verse 14 to 16, we see some details about the ark that Noah is commanded to instruct. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about this ark because this is something probably most of us, uh, if you've been in church for a long time, you've probably heard the, the account of Noah. You've probably maybe read it. Maybe you've studied it. Uh, if you're, maybe you grew up in the church as a child and you, you know, heard of the nursery rhymes and the songs. And uh, I, I, in fact, remember at one of the churches that Jill and I were at when, when we first got saved, uh, we helped paint the nursery and I painted this ark and the animals and stuff on there. We've all seen the nursery thing, right? Uh, and, and all those things. Um, so there are many questions about that. Um, and different thoughts about the ark, and so I do want to talk about it a little bit. And I would say to that point, as I'm talking about it, go ahead and put that next slide up. Don't picture this, okay? Uh, that's something like what I painted on the wall, and I know it's, it's happy and it's fun and the nursery and the babies and all those things, uh, but not very accurate, okay? Not very accurate. And instead, I would say go ahead to the next slide and picture something like that, Okay. Um, this would have been probably more like what it would have looked like, like a rectangular barge. Uh, it wouldn't even look like, I don't believe, like a ship. We don't see that there was this, this bottom and this hull and thing that even some of the re recreations today have those kinds of things. This, in, in my mind, in the descriptions that I see and so many commentators that, that say the same things, would have been like a huge house. It would have been like a huge fortress that was built like this, that just would have been waterproof. It didn't have to be seaworthy in the sense of it needed to sail anywhere, right? It needed to be seaworthy in, in what way? It needed to float to keep them alive, okay? So it wasn't like the Titanic or some kind of ship. It was more like a big rectangular barge, okay? So it was covered, it says, well, first off, it says in verse 14, he says to use gopher wood and whatever that is. Okay, I've got, no, uh, I've got no insight for you. Uh, the best insights that I've seen from scholars and commentators is perhaps it was cypress, perhaps it was cedar, because we do see that type of wood talked about. Uh, you know, we don't know what gopher wood is. Uh, whatever it is, I would assume that because God told them to build it out of that, it was the best wood to use to be waterproof and to be floatable, right? And seaworthy, we understand that. It's also covered in pitch. So, some type of organic substance, sappy, gooey, tarry pitch, right, is the understanding, if we understand what pitch is, and what would that be for? That would be to cover it inside and out so that it would be sealed, right, so that it would be waterproof, uh, and so that there would be nothing, no water that would be able to come in, so it would be watertight uh, and, again, seaworthy, okay? Now, it says in verse 16, it was to have a lower and second and third decks, so that means it was three stories, okay? It's three levels, three stories high. And it says to divide it up into rooms. Picture these pods, these rooms, these nests, really, right? Because what, it, what is the, the primary thing that is in there? Animals, okay? Pens and nests and rooms for animals and separation from, from Noah, obviously, and his family and separating all, all these animals and keeping them to their kinds, Okay, it also says that Noah was to put a window near the top. Verse 16 says a cubit from the top. Uh, I would assume that this was probably for light, right? To get light into uh, the darkness of, imagine building that big thing and having no windows or anything. It would be very dark. Certainly now they've got fire and they can light things and God could light it with however he wants to. Uh, but the point is God told him to put in a window. And so it's probably for that, probably uh, perhaps also maybe for ventilation. Anybody think that might be a problem uh, with all these animals? Uh, and so there is a thought that across, if you see on that one, there's, a, there's all those things at the top, but there is this thought that perhaps there was uh, protruding with the measurements that there's perhaps a protruding thing. And what this means where it says a window going from a cubit from the top would be that from the top of this, there would not be just one window, but around the entire thing, perhaps a cubit, which we'll get into in a moment, but roughly a cubit is from your elbow to the tip of your fingertips. So roughly a conservative cubit is 18 inches. So 
a, a window of a foot and a half or so around the entire thing. So again, these are speculative thoughts, uh, but certainly we understand that God is able to, to bring the light and to bring the ventilation so that no one in his family could breathe. He can take care of all those things, right? So, uh, and, and again, in that, I say it not jokingly, but in reality, right? Because let's not overlook, everyone, the miracle that this is. This is miraculous. And that, yeah, God could make it if he wanted to, that these animals never had to uh, dispose of their waste the entire time. Couldn't he? He made it. It says that Noah gathered two of every kind, but then later it says they came to him. Don't miss the miracles in all of this. These animals paraded. Why? Because God told them, go to Noah to be saved. And they came parading right onto the ark. It's not like he had to go and find all these things, okay? So don't miss the miraculous. Uh, let's not do that in, in any of this. So now we have the dimensions. God gives Noah the dimensions of the ark that he's told to build. Look at them in verse 15. Length, 300 cubits. Breadth, 50 cubits. Width, uh, excuse me, that is the width. Breadth or width is 50 cubits. Height, 30 cubits. So again, different thoughts that I won't bore you on about the three uh, cubits that were used in ancient times and what the thought process is. The conservative number is about 18 inches on a cubit. Okay, so and it makes easier math too because when you go to figure that out, 300 cubits, you multiply that by 1.5, a foot and a half. And it means that we have 450 feet is the length of uh, the ship. For the width, we have 75 feet, and for the height, we have 45 feet. So a good picture when I was thinking about it is think about a football field. How long is a football field? Okay, good. I heard already people converting already ahead of us. 100 yards, right, But which is 300 feet. And that's really from goal line to goal line. When you put the end zones on, how long is the end zone? 10 yards. Okay, so that's 30 more feet on each side. So you have 360 feet is the length of a football field. So we need, what, 90 more feet? So take roughly a third of another football field. So we have a football field a third, and there's your envision what you got there if you've been to a football game. There's the length of, of this ship, okay, and really of this, this house, right, this floating houseboat. So that, I hope, gives you a good picture of what it might look like. Now, a football field is also 160 feet wide, sideline to sideline. This thing is 75 feet wide. So it's about half the width of a football field. And then it's 45 feet tall. So that's a, about a four or five story building. Okay, so call it a four story building just for discussion's sake. So that's what you got. Football field and a third, half of a football field length and four stories tall. So a lot of space in here, a lot of rooms to make, a lot of pods to make. And I want to go through some of this just because I find it fascinating and I'll go through it quick, but I, I think it is helpful. Um, I won't bore you again with all the calculations, but for the mathematicians out there, here's what, here's what I came up with, with with help of other much smarter people than myself. Um, you come up with the cubic footage, and you find that if you multiply that cubic footage out and divide it up, you could fit 550 uh, railroad cars. You know those railroad box cars that are on railroads, uh, on trains? 550 of those you could fit inside this this arc, okay? So scientists believe that there had to be anywhere between 16,000 and 50,000 animals uh, at this time that they needed to take on the ark to repopulate the earth with the animals, okay? And even including some that are extinct is in their numbers. So a popular question that perhaps you have heard or asked is, how in the world did all the animals fit on the ark? Well, uh, a couple things is that you didn't have to take every single species of animal onto the ark. Notice that it says in kinds, in kinds, and you can go into other studies of that. I can point you and direct you to if, if you would like, but just think of dogs as an example. You can take two dogs, and out of those two dogs, you can get a multitude of variations from two dogs. You don't have to take every single type of dog. You take two dogs. Are you with me? So the numbers of animals are cut down vastly uh, in understanding it doesn't have to be every species, but that those species could be repopulated through just these kinds that they bring, okay? Variations will still happen. Now, the average size of the animal is believed to be about the size of a sheep, 
So when you say, oh, what about giant dinosaurs? Were there dinosaurs before the flood? Were there not? Uh, again, another topic of discussion for later. What about these huge animals and zebras and giraffes and all those things? Well, did they have to take full-grown ones? No, right? They could take smaller ones. They could take young ones. Uh, and so that would be a possibility as well. And so when you take all the creepy things, all the birds, all the little animals, you're going to bring that size down a lot to where the size is, is thought to be a, of like a sheep is an average size. Okay? So if that's the case then, the ark could actually carry over 150,000 animals. So there's no problem with the 50,000 number that skeptics have. Because if that were the size, then they could, help, they could hold three times that amount. So in fact, the question is not, how did all the, the animals fit? Why did Noah, uh, you know, how did Noah fit all the animals on the ark? The question actually is, why did Noah build the ark so big? He didn't even need all the space and all the room. And obviously we know the answer is God told him to build it this way. And I want you to understand there's plenty of room on this thing. Okay? It, it, there's no problem with uh, you know, the cynics and the secular world that will say to you, those are impossibilities. No, it's really not. It's very logical, and, and you can figure out that it, it is possible. And we know that it was possible, and it did happen. So we know, again, ultimately, God is the one who preserves his people. He is the one who t instructs and commands, and Noah obeys, and it works out for his good because it's for God's good and his plan. Verse 18, we see that God confirms a covenant. Now, this is the first time in, in the scriptures so far that we see this term covenant. As God says, I will establish my covenant with you. Well, what is a covenant? A covenant is uh, an alliance. It's a pledge. It's a promise, right? Um, this is God's promise to Noah a promise and a covenant of deliverance, a covenant of grace, right? A covenant of preservation of, of his family and of mankind through his family. And God will, in fact, expound on this covenant in chapter 9 when we get there. We're going to see that he tells Noah all about uh, this covenant that he has with his family, not even only with his family, but with all of creation. Because remember, his covenant and his promises to never again destroy all things on the earth by water. Okay, so that is a promise. In fact, he makes a sign to that covenant, which is what? The rainbow. Right, good. So there's a sign to that covenant. We'll see all that again when we get into chapter 9. But this is the beginning of that. So as we progress, we will see many covenants. We could, uh, we could sit here and I could talk for another hour about covenants because it is something that is important. It is something that we see all throughout the scriptures. Uh, we see this is called the Noahic covenant. We will see uh, there's the Abrahamic covenant. There's the Davidic covenant. There's the Mosaic covenant. You notice those names, Moses, David, Abraham, Noah, right? These covenants, these promises that come. Uh, and, and many other ones that we can look at as well. Uh, but all these promises, all these covenants, are promises to God's chosen people. And of all of them, in every one of them, we see that God is gracious and he is merciful to his people, right? That he promises these things. And that I would say in most of them, if not all of them, are a unilateral covenant, meaning one way. <laughs> Praise God, amen? Because... If it was a bilateral covenant, that means you have to bring something and you have to do something to earn it. That's like a contract. Uh, Jason, I say, I will pay you this if you fix my refrigerator like this, right? That's a contract. That's a covenant. That's an agreement. God says, I've done everything. One way, unilateral. Praise God for that because we would all be on our way to somewhere where we don't want to go if it were up to us. So, and nowhere do we see the truth of that, but in what? The new covenant, right? As Jesus says, the new covenant in my blood. That's right. The new covenant is Christ. The promise that really isn't new as we think about Genesis here, because when was this promise made? Genesis 3.15. There's the promise. There's the covenant. And that new covenant is in Christ Jesus. That through his death and resurrection, he fulfilled Genesis 3.15, right? Praise the Lord. Next thing we see is that Noah was to be a caretaker. 
caretaker in verse 19 to 21. Even as I say that, I think of Cain and Abel. And what was Cain's comment when God asked him about it? He said, oh, am I my brother's keeper, right? I'm not a caretaker of that guy. I'm not the boss of him. Well, we see here that Noah is called to be a steward, right? And to be a caretaker here. God instructs him to bring two of every kind into the ark, male and female, birds, animals, creepy things. We see in verse 20, each after again, their kind. He says that two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. So there you have it. Uh, Noah is to care for his family. Noah is to care for the rest of creation that God put under his charge, right? God entrusted Noah to be a steward and a caretaker of everything else that he is saving in this ark. Noah is then instructed to take food, right? It says to take food for his family and as well for the animals. Okay, so again, Noah is called to care for his family. Certainly we can apply that to us. We are called to care for our families. But ultimately we know who is the provider of all these things. As I look at Sky, I know he loves uh, the name of God, Jehovah Jireh, right? Which means the Lord provides. God provides everything that we need. Right? We are entrusted to be good stewards and good caretakers, but we know that ultimately, as James says, every good and perfect thing comes from above, from the Father of lights. All things come from Him. We conclude today's text in verse 22 with conformity okay, or obedience, but you notice obedience doesn't start with C, so it has to be conformity. Right? <laughs> as again, we see here the word all right? Look in verse uh, 22. It says, thus did Noah according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. All, every. Again, here's the word. This time, the word all is referring to Noah's obedience. That's an awesome sign, an awesome example, right? That Noah obeyed God in all that he commanded. Aren't we called to obey God in all that he commands us? Correct. I believe I read that someplace before. Jesus, in fact, says, if you love me, what will you do? That's right. You'll keep my commandments, right? I understand it's difficult and we know that, but this is a, a, a great thing to see here, that Noah was obedient in all the things that God told him. So in this morning's text, we've seen how unpleased God is with sin, right? And the corruption of of mankind and the corruption of the world because of the sin of man, the wickedness of mankind, and that God is going to send judgment upon them for their sin. Remember, God doesn't just judge sin. It's not just sin that's thrown into the lake of fire, you guys. It's sinners who sin, okay? God's judgment is upon sinners. And in this, we also again see that God is righteous, he is holy, he is just. He is not unfair in what he's doing, is he? No, he is in fact fair in what he's doing. He gives us what we deserve, that being hell and alienation from God because of our sin. It's not fair. And again, you don't want fair. You want grace. You want mercy. You want long-suffering. You want forgiveness. And so, again, on the other side of that coin, we do see that. We do see grace. We do see mercy. And how he chose to save Noah and his family from this wrath of his that is coming. And again, this is just a snapshot for us, right? This is just something that we see reoccurring all through the scriptures. And this is a great snapshot to see God's story his plan of redemption for mankind. And it's clearly seen right here. Just as mankind was wicked in Noah's day, mankind's wicked in our day. Yes? Amen? For sure. Just as judgment was impending upon them in that day, judgment too is impending upon the ungodly in our day. So, whether or not you make it to that day, right, the day of the Lord and the day of that final judgment and those things to come, or you die before that, this text applies to you. Yes? There's only two lineages. There's only two groups. 
There's only two places this text applies because God is holy and righteous and because he does judge sin and because he will judge sin and because he must judge sin. Romans 3.23 clearly tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of that sin is what? Death. That's right. The wages, what you have coming to you that is deserved is death. But God is gracious and merciful. Praise the Lord. And just as he chose to save Noah and his family from punishment that they deserve, did Noah and his family deserve it? Yep, they're sinners too. Well, in the same way, we also deserve judgment. In the grace we see here, that as he chose to save Noah and his family from that punishment, He also offers to save us from the punishment of the wrath that is to come, and that is in Christ. So if you think about it, this story, this ark, this whole account here is is really just what? A picture of Christ. (laughs) Isn't that what we keep talking about, that this is what the Bible is all about? Everything in here points to Christ. Everything is a picture of Christ. God graciously provided the ark to save sinners. Guess what? He graciously provided Christ to save sinners. That's the picture. Just as Noah's family had to come into the ark to be saved from the wrath to come, we too must be in Christ to be saved from the wrath of God. That's the whole story. That's all I got. That's what this book is all about. It's about God. And it's about his plan to save sinners who don't deserve to be saved. And I am eternally grateful that I am one of those. I pray that you are too. And another thing comes to my mind now as it's in verse, um, I don't know, you can look it up and find it there for me. It's in one of the verses here, I think 16, where it's talking about the description of the ark and it talks about the window. Another thing that it said was the door. It said to put the door on the side. Notice it says the door singular. One door. There's one way in. I know you already see where I'm going, right? I am the way. I am the door, he says in John chapter 10. The good shepherd, I'm the door. Yeah, there's one door. It's Christ. There's one way. It's Jesus. That's it. That's the whole story. There's only one. Acts 4.12 says the same thing, that there is salvation in no other. That means only one. Because there's only one name given under heaven among men by which you must be saved. It's only in the name of Christ, whom God has graciously provided for sinners like you and me. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. And so I would be amiss if I didn't tell you the gospel of Christ, that Jesus left the confines of heaven. The Son of God came to this planet to be hung on a tree, and not for himself, but for us and for all who believe. Because he lived a perfect life that we cannot live, he died and took the punishment that we deserve, and that on that cross he paid for and took on himself the wrath of an almighty God who is filled with hatred of the iniquities of mankind. He paid for that. He took it on him. He died and three days later rose from the grave showing that in fact he's greater than that. That he conquered sin. He conquered and defeated hell and Satan and death because he's alive. Our hope is not in a God or a Savior that is dead. Amen? Our Savior is risen and he is alive. He is gracious. He is merciful. He is kind. But he's also just. He's also holy. He's also perfect. And he says that anyone who believes in this gospel will be saved. So my call to you is to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for this gathering of your people in this place as we continue to unpack your word 
and as you continue to unpack the depths of it to us, as you continue to reveal yourself more and more to us, God, the gospel and just what you've done for us is weighing so heavy on me right now. I can't help but be emotional, and I can't help but think of people who are perishing, even today, without salvation and without Jesus Christ. God, I pray that we never become complacent. May I never get my heart hardened to the gospel and to preaching it and to sharing it and to hearing it and to speaking it to one another, even to believers like we do here every week because it should change us every week and every day. We should constantly preach the gospel every day and every week because we need it every day and every week. Lord, we desperately need you. We thank you for salvation for sanctification and god i pray that you would equip us this little small church and first baptist of Isla Mirada, that you would equip us to be a greater lighthouse that we would be focused that we would have a heart for the community around us a heart for the world around us that we would start in our families that we would go out into our communities and out into this world god that we would be ambassadors as you call us to be representatives that we would share the good news of salvation that is found in the name of Jesus Christ, in which we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Craig. Please stand as we close this morning, uh, singing, uh, praising God, uh, singing, I Stand Amazed. Stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me he took my sins and my sorrows he made them his very own he bore the burden to and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. in glory his face I and last shall see it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Sing that again. How marvelous, how wonderful and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love Amen. Thank you. Remember now, we are going to break for 12 minutes, so that'll be um, at 1236. We'll be back in here. Miss Stephanie's going over to Building 2 if you have any children that uh, want to stay with her during the family meeting. Instead of drawing in here, they're welcome to join Miss Stephanie as she heads over now. For those of you remaining, uh, grab a snack off of Adam's truck. We'll see you back at 1236.